Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I take a look back at some of the best bits of the year 2016. Personally, it was very difficult to choose some of the best bits as I really enjoyed all the conversations I've had with my previous guests. This episode is part one of two, and I've chosen guests who had similar themes in terms of discussing some past great economists like John Maynard Keynes, Hayek, Karl Marx, Adam Smith, and von Mises. We also look at some common themes such as inequality, capitalism, ecology, and fairness. For a full list of episodes, visit economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts or visit economicrockstar.com forward slash best of part one for a list of these specific episodes. Make sure to complement your listening of these episodes with other great episodes that may not have featured on this best of, including episode 102 with Matthias Fernengo and John Maynard Keynes, episode 84, Mises versus Marx, a discussion with Peter Betke, Episode 78 with Arnold Kling on the hidden story of how markets work. And episode 86 with Philip Pilkington on determinism and the reformation in economics. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. In this short clip, I speak with Professor Darren Asimoglu, who discusses inequality, philanthropy, inclusive institutions and creative destruction. You can listen to the full episode in episode 68 on why nations fail and why inequality exists between countries. So in order for a democratic society to thrive or even to have a pluralistic state, should you exploit these ideas and talents and spread them among the whole population of a nation or should they concentrate on creating or maintaining this inequality based on the risks that these individuals take and to protect their property rights? I think, you know, the uh, principle of inclusive institutions that we are, we have defined and we defend is that the first thing you have to do is provide opportunities in a very, very broad-based manner. And if you provide, provide opportunities in a very, very broad-based manner, it's not going to be that you want to just defend those with the highest skills at the expense of the rest. You don't want to defend Facebook in the face of new competition or Microsoft. You want to make sure that they get rewarded for what they create. But you also make it very easy for competitors to enter, even in industries such as software or web-based services that have these strong network externalities. It's not that you should punish a top doctor because he's such a skilled surgeon. But you should create an environment in which other doctors can train to be as skilled and strong. What you should punish people for is if you see that they are breaking the laws in order to create an unfair advantage for them. And that's what the Department of Justice does, or that's what the Securities and Exchange Commission is supposed to do, but fails to do in the United States. What are your views on philanthropy? Well, I think it's mixed. You know, I think that the uh, state in an inclusive society has a role also for redistribution. I think, not that I am a rosy-eyed sort of admirer of Swedish or other Scandinavian societies, but those are strongly inclusive societies in terms of their political systems. I think they have some, they make some important mistakes in terms of their economic systems. But they have broad-based support for creating a safety net that makes sure that Everybody lives at a decent living standard. Quite importantly, actually, these societies have been undergoing a lot of increasing inequality, showing that it's not a problem of politics only. It's not a problem of just rent-seeking by a few people in the Anglo-Saxon societies. But it is important that the state does play some of that redistributive role. How much of it? That's a discussion we need to have. What worries me about philanthropy is that it often takes over from the state. In the United States, for instance, we have a situation in which a lot of poverty is not alleviated by local governments or the federal government, and then the Catholic Church plays a huge role. Do I appreciate what the Catholic Church is doing? Sure, of course. 
But I do worry that some of that should be done by the state. Now, that concern is a little bit harder when it comes or becomes more complicated when it comes to sort of international aid. The United States government will never receive support from its voters, you know, just to make huge donations to international causes. So perhaps it's okay that, you know, Bill Gates gives part of his enormous fortune for that purpose. And I do appreciate that, and I think it's important that people use some of their, those immense fortunes that they make for good causes. But it does raise a lot of issues about, you know, who decides what's a good cause, and how do you make sure that these are still subject to the sorts of checks that we like in an inclusive society? What do I mean by that? So imagine that it was the government giving money to certain causes. Well, it would still be subject to control by courts, Congress, voters, civil society. Well, if it's an individual philanthropist, well, it's not really subject to any checks. So perhaps that individual philanthropist can give all of his or her money to something that's his or her pet project, but it's actually not that good. Imagine a philanthropist giving a huge amount of money so that condoms are discouraged uh, from being used in places that are endemic in HIV. So there are some questions of accountability that need to be asked in the case of philanthropy as well. I'm sure a lot of countries, there's always that giving, that charitable giving mm -hmm. within to help people that the government say or claim that they don't have the infrastructure, the capital to actually mm -hmm. maintain services. Right. But by helping or by being charitable or by identifying less equal or op less opportunistic situations for people, educating those people could bring about some fortune, fortunate circumstances in the future that could help develop a new technology. Or And we, and we see it, I suppose, with the ending of uh, segregation in the 1960s. Absolutely, absolutely. We've and, had and so much successes going on as well. Absolutely. But, you know, that was not a philanthropic action. I think no, no. there's a huge difference between <clears throat> a... Uh, but it was breaking down barriers, or it was breaking down, as you talked about, political institutions. Right. It's as an institutional change driven by civil society. You know, it wasn't driven by the state so much. The state then came to play in a very major role. But in response to civil society, to, you know... Organizations like uh, NACP, uh, NAACP, and uh, other black organizations organizing marches, protests, and you know other civil society organizations, both from the south and the north, mobilizing. But that's that's sort of different from one individual or one family coming to dominate a particular area. How important is Schumpeter's theory of creative destruction to your thesis on why nations fail? Because you kind of hinted on it earlier on there a moment ago that governments or the U.S. government should not protect a certain industry or a company, oh. that they should allow open competition because that's what makes the state healthy yes. and uh, thrive. Yes, absolutely. It's central, and we discuss it, in, uh, we discuss it at length in the book, uh, both in the, in the form that Schumpeter himself formulated it, but also we sort of extended it to the political sphere and why there, the, there is sort of a need for political creative destruction and how fear of political creative destruction is one of the factors inimical to political change and uh, one of the factors that gets to maintain these extractive institutions. This next short clip is taken from episode 108 with Professor Steve Horvitz. He talks about the micro foundations of macroeconomics and what caused the Great Recession. Don't forget to check out that episode if you want to listen to the full conversation with Professor Horvitz. The recent financial crisis or the Great Recession, was this a micro problem that led eventually to a macro problem or would it have been a macro problem <laughs> that has caused well, micro problems since? Right, good. Um, so I think I think it's both. And it's, right, I, I think we think about the Great Recession, we had a couple things going on. We, the, the macro problem that started it 
was excess credit from the Federal Reserve, right? And and sort of the you know the excess lending that took place really post nine eleven that sort of provided this the spark, right? The gasoline that made that lit this thing on fire. But at the same time, or maybe the spark of rather than gasoline. But at the same time, you had bad policy that was artificially supporting the U.S. and housing market and housing market and other places, right? That 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 channeled the excess credit created by the Fed into the housing market and sort of made possible rising housing prices and then all the other kinds of financial instruments we had built on top of that. You had US, a U.S. regulatory system that was you know, uh, favoring things like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and enabling them to buy up mortgages without having to worry about whether they were profitable or not. So you had a macro problem the excess credit. You had interferences in the microeconomy that distorted incentives and prices. The result of that was an Austrian style boom that manifested in the housing industry. And of course, when that turned to bust, right, you have system wide, you have high unemployment, right? You have recession in terms of negative GDP growth. You have all the traditional macroeconomic problems. But notice those macroeconomic problems were the result of distorted micro prices, distorted interest rates, distorted housing prices, distorted profit signals created by by the favored treatment of the of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So I mean, we can, you know, we can go into more detail, but but you're right in a sense that the way I might put it is What happened in the Great Recession was you had a macro distortion from the credit market combined with micro distortions in the housing market that led to a boom and bust, which are system wide up and down in the economy. But again, you can't understand those macro consequences without focusing on the way in which prices and interest rates were distorted by both monetary policy and by regulatory policy. How fearful do Austrian economists Or how fearful are Austrian economists about the role of government and how larger it seems to be getting? Because you mentioned there about Fed policies and, you know, I know some Austrian economists would favor free banking and the the, the reduction in the powers of the Fed. But we see the increasing power of big government now and that as economists would economists would typically worry about the role that they would have and the influence they would have on markets. Yeah, and and certainly Austrians have been worried about the size of government almost from the beginning of Austrian economics. I mean, you certainly see it in Menger a bit, but Mises and Hayek growing, you know, sort of being intellectually mature as they were coming to intellectual maturity sort of between the wars and and into the the sort of period of the Great Depression, World War II, were then worried about the size of government. And certainly, you know, if both were alive today, either were alive today, they would be as well. And modern Austrians worry about this for a, for a bunch of reasons. One, you know, just from a sh- sort of more narrowly economic perspective, uh, Austrians have long argued that governments are notoriously inefficient, right? That, that governments can't allocate resources in the ways they think they can or wish they can. Uh, and, and we get tremendous waste from, go- from, from growing government. Um, and, and that, that's the same sort of knowledge type problems that the Mises and Hayek talked about with socialism in general applies on a somewhat smaller scale to other kinds of government intervention. But further worries here include the way in which not just the increasing size of government, but its scope of power and the reduction in the rule of law and more discretion to central banks and other institutions undermines the stability of the institutional framework that's necessary for economic growth. When entrepreneurs don't know what the rules of the game are, they don't know what choices to make. And, and that uncertainty makes it less likely that they'll make that they'll make growth, you know, growth promoting choices. So we have a system, we have a situation in which the distorting effects of monetary policy, of fiscal policy, of regulatory policy are creating an environment in which it's very difficult for entrepreneurs to read price signals and, and sort of figure out what to do. As a result, they tend to want to turn to politics to solve these problems. And we get a growth, you know, we get this increase in sort of crony capitalism and the rise of uh, state corporate partnerships that that are I think Austrians rightly fear. And and public choice analysis is important here too in understanding that the incentives for politicians is to are such that they will grow government. And they will grow government in, in sort of conjunction with private sector f- firms who see in, in grabbing political power and political favoritism a way to make profits without having to worry about competition and pleasing consumers. And so from an Austrian perspective, what we're seeing happen is is dangerous on multiple levels and, and problematic on multiple levels. I think if you go outside of Austrian economics to the degree that 
many Austrians think of themselves as libertarians, there's, they're, they're worried more generally about, again, the sort of growth in the scope of power of the state and the, not just its size, but its scope and the kinds of decisions it can make and the t- kinds of ways it can pre- prevent private actors from making decisions uh, are, are both you know, damaging to economic growth and human flourishing and human liberty. And Steve, you are a member of the Mount Pelerin Society. Is it- yes, which which is meeting even as we are recording this. They're meeting down in Miami, Florida. Fantastic. Because I was just going to say, uh, you know, they have regular meetings, I think monthly meetings. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a – and it is somewhat a, a closed society that you have to have yeah. – you know, go through some protocols in order to get membership. But what would typical meetings be like if you're able to discuss that or give an overview? Yeah, yeah I mean they, they actually the, – the, the society meets every – has an international meeting every two years and has regional meetings – in between those, um, it's more or less a, a, a really nice uh, academic type conference, right? People present papers and discuss papers like you would see at a you know an economics or a political science meeting. It's obviously more interdisciplinary than any one of those, and you have people not just academics but people from the policy world. I mean, it was created. You know, one of the reasons Hayek was so keen to create it was to create a network, an institution, an organization where. In the 1940s, the the small number of classical liberals, libertarians, could get together and share ideas and strategies and not have to worry about the pressures of their disciplines or the larger world. And he explicitly created it for intellectuals, not just academics. So again, you do have policy people and business people, all, all kinds of folks who attend those meetings. So they're not. There's nothing, you know weird or mysterious or nefarious going on. It's it's uh, people, it's sharing ideas and networking about strategy and uh, and an opportunity to connect with, with people from around the world who share your values and beliefs and ways of seeing the world. Uh, it's a, and they're lovely. I haven't been to one for a little while, but they're always very lovely. In this next clip, I speak with Denise Cummins from episode 88, who discusses reciprocity and fairness. If you have come across research or you have done it yourself, and looked at maybe anthropology and how we have evolved as as humans and even in our social systems based on uh, cities. And so we we effectively have moved from small, and you refer to it, they're small tribal populations. They're called small scale societies, yeah. Small scale societies. So um, (laughs) what we would have had then would be maybe more of a close-knit society where almost like a village like whereby everybody really knows one another and you may have the reciprocity that would be natural in terms of creating a fair society and giving back based on what people have done for you but in larger cities where we have grown in terms of population size and people do not know one another and you know not even by name would we be losing this type of altruistic behavior in say majority of time in terms of our life, un- unless we come across some kind of danger where we kind of automatically uh, band or bond together. Yeah, actually, there's been a lot of uh, anthropological work on on exactly that issue and papers that have been written. And it's uh, one of the things that comes out cr- pretty clearly is that the boundaries get pushed in large scale societies because of the anonymity. That is, in a small scale scale society, okay, all of my trans, my economic transaction partners are right there. They're in front of me. I see them, and I'm going to see them tomorrow. Uh, so uh, the 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 cost involved in stiffing somebody is just too high. Mm. But in a large scale society, the opportunities for anonymity are much greater, right? There's no way that you could possibly know everybody who lives in in most of, you know in a city. Uh, in a major city, uh, you know, with, with a population of, of even at something as low as 10,000. There's just no way you're going to know everybody. And so the opportunities for cheating, the opportunities for failure to reciprocate are quite, are quite high. You can just, in fact, this is what con men do. They just skip around from town to town taking advantage of people. And the reason they can take advantage of people is because we seem to be born with these biases towards trust, towards reciprocity, towards or, or expectations of fairness and reciprocity. And as a result, you get your one shot usually, okay? You get your one shot to basically cheat them, and, and then you have to leave town. So, again, in, uh, if you look at this again through you know, uh, economic theory or through evolutionary biology, cheating in these kinds of environments is advantageous in one shot, uh, transactions. It's, uh, that's the, the rational choice. 
but in multiple, if there are going to be multiple opportunities for interactions, for economic transactions, and you will know those parties, you can recognize those individuals, okay, the cost for, fail, for cheating, for failing to, to reciprocate is just too high because you can get shut out. You can get shut out from the game. And, you know, if you're in a small scale society, uh, where do you go? <laughs> in a large one, you just go to the next community, right? You just, you know, you, there's, a, there's nearly an endless supply of, of people to take advantage of. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we see these kind of things, again, uh, when you bring naive reasoners into the, into the lab. And by naive, I, I mean basically uh, somebody who, who isn't a tried and true you know, economic theorist uh, who knows all of this literature, even uh, sort of beginning economic students. You can bring them into the laboratory. You can have them engage in these kinds of transactions, and they will behave pretty much like someone from a small-scale society. They will come in with a bias towards trust and an expectation of fairness. And if that does not happen, <laughs> it's, it's a problem. You can have some very interesting, and if you don't have this, this mindset, if you don't know this literature and you don't know evolutionary biology, you will get behavior that seems incomprehensible. So, for example, people are willing to pay a penalty, penalty for the opportunity to punish non-reciprocators in multiple prisoner uh, dilemma games, okay? They will actually pony up money to punish someone who failed to reciprocate, even if they are observers to the game, even if they, are, they themselves were not cheated. That is how strong we have this norm, <clears throat> this embedded norm of recipro reciprocity and fairness. Professor Diane Coyle of Manchester University features in episode 69, and here she discusses GDP, the Happiness Index, the Human Development Index, and economics being a soulful science and how very human a science good economics is by being concerned about improving the well-being of people. Yes, and the Human Development Index, and there's also the Gross National Happiness Index as well, and they measure more than the economic indicator of productivity. They include a lot of subjective um, measures of happiness and well-being and so on. I, I do find these equally as important or more important today than they have been in the past. Do you know, I actually find them less important. Right. The Human Development Index includes gross domestic product per capita and a number of other indicators such as life expectancy, literacy rates, access to clean water and technology and, and so on. And so it's a very useful um, indicator for development economists to look at how countries are progressing compared to each other. But it doesn't give you a lot of extra information, particularly over time, compared to just looking at GDP. The thing about gross national happiness is that, well, I'm actually really sceptical about it. People's happiness adjusts very quickly. And there is a lot of um, research showing that if something happens to you that's marvellous, like winning the lottery or terrible, like having a bad accident, then your level of happiness that you report changes for a bit and then you adjust back to where you were to start with. So if you ask on a nationwide level how happy people are, normally everybody says, oh, six or seven, and it doesn't change very much over time. There's just not a lot of information in that. And I don't see any way why you would expect a psychological state like happiness or well-being or contentment to give you very much information about the public policies of any kind, including including economic policies. It's just It's just a different sort of number. And people say, well, we stop getting any happier as GDP continues to go up. And I don't find that surprising because GDP is an artificial idea and it can rise without limit. It could be 10 or it could be uh, 6.8 trillion. And happiness is a survey and people are asked to rank it between 0 and 10 or sometimes between 0 and 3. And it's never going to be at all related to, to uh, what you're measuring that's happening in the economy. And I think using happiness is a kind of excuse for inactivity. If people living in Bangladesh say they're pretty happy anyway, why would you bother doing anything about it? Yes, that just reminds me of something I came across recently, actually. Oh, hysteresis. 
whereby yes. you you might be unemployed for a certain period of time yeah. and you experience that huge fall in income, but then you get readjust to your lifestyle in terms of, say, staying at home and you find a point that's almost to go back to work because whether you're happy or not, but staying at home outweighs the potential of going back to work and earning that slightly higher or higher income. That's, that's certainly part of it. Yeah, I, I know it's not in a way related, but it just triggered a thought there. Diane, your other book is quite interesting, The Soulful Science. But firstly, I want to ask you, why did you call it The Soulful Science? A lot of people call it The Dismal Science and uh, think that's a, a term of disparagement. Actually, the history of that term is quite honourable for economics. It was coined by the historian Thomas Carlyle, who objected to economists like John Stuart Mill at the time being opposed to slavery. On the Mill was opposed to it on the very obvious grounds that all human beings deserved equal respect and counted equally when you were thinking about what was happening in the economy or society. And Carlyle, who was a conservative historian and believed in property rights and uh, was okay with the idea that you could own other people, was objecting to economists taking part in the anti-slavery campaign, so he called it the dismal science. Actually, I think that's a badge of honour. But most people take it as a criticism of economics. So I wanted to point out, actually, how very human a science good economics is, that it is concerned about improving the well-being of people in the economic arena of society. And so the book looks at all the research at that time, all the most recent research in different areas of economics. Because a lot of critics say economics is just about money and economists all think it's all about markets and that's all the counts and markets are getting everywhere. Whereas actually that might have been true, or a bit, a bit of a caricature, but more true around 1980 or 1985 at the height of Thatcherism and Reaganism. But for the past 20 years, economists have been looking at been looking at happiness, have been looking at what's called behavioural economics, which is bringing psychology and all the quirks about how humans take decisions into economic modelling, have been looking at the importance of political institutions for development and growth, have been paying more attention to using experimental methods in economics to get better evidence. So the subject now bears absolutely no resemblance to the caricature that many people have in mind when they criticise it. And you mentioned it's a badge of honour. Is that just because Thomas Carlyle had recognised the fact that we were becoming more soulful, as you mentioned, in terms of respecting human quality of life in the economy? He dis yes, he disapproved. He disapproved yeah. of, of that equality of respect for people that's inherent in the individualism of economics. I continue the conversation with Russ Roberts, who has his own podcast. If you haven't heard of it yet, please check out Econ Talk. Russ features in episode 104, and he gives me his definition of economics, talks about Adam Smith and happiness. How has economics changed, or what is your definition of economics? Now that you have the, the readings of Adam Smith, and possibly those beforehand and those after, and how you apply it today, well, economics is often called, it's usually called a social science. The Nobel Prize in economics is the is the Nobel Prize in economic science. And I don't like that word. I don't think uh, we should call ourselves a science. I think we're more of an art. And I think we're jealous of physics and chemistry and biology. We want to be like them. And I think that's a mistake. We do not have the precision yeah. that, say, physics and chemistry have. And even though we can use advanced mathematics and fancy statistics, but I think it's important to remember that um, for me, what economics is, is the application of some ways of thinking to help understand the complexity of the world around us. So that would be one way I would think about economics. Those key concepts are opportunity cost, uh, the role of incentives, and then the kind of phenomena, phenomena that we've been talking about, complex emergent order what is sometimes called in economics market forces. The reason I don't always like that phrase market forces, it makes it sounds like it well, sounds like it has to do with the stock market or a farmer's market. And yet to me, market forces is everything. It's, it, it includes, for example, to take an extreme case after, after a war when a lot of men have died and the ratio between men and women has changed, 
uh, men and women treat each other differently than they do when there isn't an imbalance between uh, the ratio of the sexes. So that to me is a market force. It's the fact that the supply of men is down and therefore the way men and women interact is going to be different. So market forces for me work in social ways. They work in all kinds of phenomena besides prices and besides the standard money prices, the standard ways we think of markets and economics. So was so one way for me to think about what economics is, is it's the study of these kind of emergent complex systems and how uh, we interact in those systems, supply and demand just being one of them. Another nice definition of economics is I, uh, that I like, I heard from a student of mine who got it from one of her professors, just unfortunate, doesn't remember which one, but it was the idea of economics is the study of how to get the most out of life. It's the idea that we have limited time on this earth and we should use it wisely. And doing one thing means not being able to do another. And economics in many ways is the study of what those decisions imply for our out- outcomes, our well-being and how we interact with each other. When we make those decisions, whether it's in the marketplace for potatoes or whether it's in the marketplace for marriage in the case of the differences in the sex ratios. So to me, economics is a very broad thing, uh, certainly for Smith. He was interested in uh, manufacturing and he was interested in education. He was interesting, interested in sympathy and he was interested in pride and he was interested in what makes us tick and he was interested in everything. And of course, I think a good economist should be interested in all those things as well, not just say the stock market or not just interest rates or unemployment, although those are important. And to me, all of it is part of, of human behavior um, in complex systems. Russ, what you were just saying there, it really opened my eyes doing a podcast like this, and I'm sure you as well, and that the more guests you have, the more niche areas of economics that they tend to bring to us. And it's really opened my, up my eyes into identifying what you had just said there, that economics is everywhere. And they talked about happiness, um, sex ratios, etc. But you mentioned one thing there that Adam Smith mentioned that economics is what makes us tick, T-I-C-K. Um, and your book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, has opened up this whole philosophy around economics that Smith has, Adam Smith had uh, discussed in his theory of mor- moral sentiments. And again, it's, to be honest, it's really opened up my eyes. I have yet to read it, but I'm definitely going to read it fairly shortly. But it's re- I really opened up my eyes that you can apply 18th century thinking in terms of human nature human behavior to to today and I'm sure way into the future. And it's a philosophy that I think people would really appreciate if they sat down to read it. Yeah, I think people misunderstand what economists are interested in, and that's partly our fault as economists. So if I said, what makes people tick? Uh, I think most people would say that economists would answer money. That's what makes us tick. You want to understand what why people do what they do. They do it for money because they're selfish. And Adam Smith would have been horrified by that, although sometimes he gets caricatured as believing that. Smith argued that what makes us tick is our desire for attention, respect, love, honor, pride. We want to be paid attention to. We want people to think highly of us. And so that's a theory of human behavior that's um, – really is as applicable today as it is as it was in 1759 when Smith published that book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Certainly money matters. Certainly people do respond to financial and monetary incentives. When you raise the salary of a certain occupation, it will attract more people otherwise than otherwise would be in it if you hold other salaries constant. Offering uh, a better benefits package will attract people into your into your company and into your into your industry, into a job. But Smith says that's not the only thing that matters. It's He said, we, in fact, that we're often mistakenly encouraged to feel that that will make us happy. And he said it usually doesn't. Money doesn't make us happy. What makes us happy is those deeper and more abiding sources of, of satisfaction, such as, as respect and friendship and love. And I think that's, you know, in some ways it's, a, it's almost it's a cliche. You can't really argue with it. But actually applying it, as Smith does to a wide range of behavior from how you behaved with your relatives, with your friends, with your coworkers, which is what I try to do in my book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life. I think that's what makes it an interesting way to think about things. And, you know, people who are offended, people who feel disrespected will do things 
that cost them money because they value their the respect they receive more than they than they do. And when you start to think more than just the, the monetary effects. So when you think about the we just take one example, a really trivial, but I think it's a helpful one. When people go to buy and sell houses, they'll often use an agent. And they give the agent a reasonably large amount of money in the United States to to uh, interact with the buyer or seller on the other side of the transaction. And the obvious question is, why would you give them that money? What do they actually achieve? And agents will tell you they do all kinds of things. They can help you price the house correctly. And that's certainly true. They can help you stage the house, as it's called. They can help you get it ready so that people would like it when they walk through it. And that's true. But one of the things that agents do is they are an intermediary between you and the other uh, side of the transaction. And that's very important because when people feel that they have not been respected or that they're trying to be taken advantage of, they'll make decisions sometimes that give away money because they do not like having their pride hurt or they don't like the idea of this person who they don't like living in their house. Uh, so often what we do with an agent is we put an, it's an arm's length way to put a little distance between ourselves and the other person we're transacting with when we know that our emotions are going to be involved. And that's a very uh, powerful thing. So that's a simple, simple example of how Smith's insight about behavior is relevant. But there's, there are many, many more. Next up is Professor Peter Betke of George Mason University. I actually spoke with Professor Betke on two occasions. And this conversation comes from episode 82, in which he discusses Frederick Hayek and John Maynard Keynes. What people like Knight and Hayek are talking about is that Keynes was not a very extremely well-trained economist in the technical meaning of that word. You can see Hayek actually on YouTube, old videos of him claiming that Keynes knew very little about the whole body of economic thought. He knew like Marshall's book, and that's basically it. So he doesn't really know what's going on in the continent. He doesn't know what goes back historically. And starting in even in 1926, you know, he's already attacking, you know, laissez-faire and the kind of caricature of laissez-faire in which rationality is hyper-rationality. And he's saying, like, people don't do that. And we don't we don't harmonize. Go back and read his essay, uh, The End of Laissez-Faire. It's a it's a very well written essay. But there's aspects of it which, you know, if you read the history of economics, you would be like, he's just building straw man after straw man here. And then you have to keep in mind uh, that, uh, you know, what he did and he, what he consciously did was, and he uses this phrase actually in the general theory, is that um, he relied on the, what he called the rogues gallery of economic thinkers. So he reached back in the history of economics and drug up all the people who economists had determined had misunderstood the nature of the core teachings of economics. And so that includes Malthus's theory of a general glut. It includes people like Major Douglas, you know, who are kind of monetary cranks. They, you know, believe that you there's no real relationship between the expansion of the money supply and the price level. You know, there's uh, he puts a focus on spending, not on savings. Uh, it's an underconsumption theory, right? Of of the of the recession, and so it's all about getting spending. It's not about savings and capital accumulation. And so, to someone like Knight, these are all a bunch of old ideas that have already been discredited, and now Keynes is repackaging them and bringing them out. Now, to Keynes's credit. Great Britain, I think that this fact is correct, but I am subject to being wrong. But I think that Great Britain had only fallen under ten, uh, under double digit unemployment from the end of World War One to the mid 30s only once. And so it's kind of like the way we think about Japan today. There's just this a massive amount of stagnation. <clears throat> What's wrong is that Keynes wanted to build a caricature, a caricature and kind of made a claim that you know, what they had been doing in Great Britain or in the United States during this long stagnation period was laissez-faire. And therefore, that's why we're, you know, in the in, in such a bad form. Whereas the reality is, is that if you read contemporary people like Hayek or whatever, they were complaining that the government was too interventionist, you know, throughout this whole period of time, right? The government's not doing the right activities. It's engaging in all these wrong activities, which is to prop up spending and to do all of these other things. So a lot of Keynesian policies, for example, especially in the United States, were already adopted well before Keynes came along. I mean, look at Roosevelt's brain trust, 
you know, Rexford Tugwell and the whole uh, fosters and catchings kind of model is dominating the way that America is is trying to tackle the Great Depression. Uh, but Keynes comes along and there's this impression that the only reason why the Great Depression has lasted as long as it did was because politicians lack the foresight to engage in these more aggressive policies. Now they start engaging in those more aggressive policies. It coincides with World War II. We end up by, you know, growing out of the Great Depression to some extent. Again, you know, just as a point of facts or evidence, remember that all the economists that were skilled in the Keynesian techniques uh, during this period of time predicted that we would go into a massive recession after the war because spending would be cut down. Government spending would cut down, right? But instead, we end up by having a kind of a post-World War II, you know, miracle of economic growth in the United States, for example. And so to someone like like Knight the or Viner or any of these other guys that were critics of Keynes in real time, they thought Keynes was drudging up all of these ideas which had been proven to be fallacious. And now he's putting it all in a bundle and bringing it out. On the other hand, you know, what you have to remember is that Keynes is just this amazingly charismatic figure. And he thought that he had developed at least according to Hayek and others, that he had developed the ideas that were the right ideas for the time. And when politicians were going to start using them the wrong way, right, Keynes thought he had enough uh, like charisma and power that he could say, you know, stop doing that and snap his fingers and they would do go back to a more classical program. This is at least how Hayek says Keynes treated inflation. That, you know, the policies that they were engaged in were, you know, from Hayek's point of view, inflationary, and that if it started to click up, inflation started to reveal itself, then Keynes said to him that, oh, I'll just tell them to stop and they'll reverse like that. And so uh, in this regard, I think it's important to think of that kind of idea of Keynes and compare it to what his reaction is to the uh, to uh, the road to serfdom, where he says that he's in complete agreement with Hayek in the moral sentiment about the more uh, the road to serfdom. He disagrees with Hayek in the sense that clearly we want more planning, not less, provided that the planning was done by people like Hayek and him. And he thought that the British system of civil service would select that out, right? And so the people wouldn't be uh, suffer from the problems of bureaucratic uh, mission creep or any of the bureaucratic dysfunctions which later public choice explains to us. And so, you know, if you understand Keynes on his own terms, there's a kind of a lack of a deep economics basis, like the way you see in some of these other thinkers like Knight. But yet at the same time, he, he, you know, he's so much more charismatic and influential figure than someone like Knight too. So uh, it's a mixed bag in those regards. In this clip, I speak with Michael Roberts from episode 85. Michael is a Marxist and he talks about capitalism and Marxism and the importance of protecting our resources and ecology. We can see a similar similar, similarity today than maybe when Marx and Engels had written the Communist Manifesto. We have overproduction. We probably have overconsumption reflected through our physical obesity, perhaps as well as our wares that we have in terms of your technology or your products that represent um, the the goods that we actually want to buy and to show others that we have this type of uh, wealth and we can show it in a certain way. But also we have destruction of rainforests to help support a lot of this overproduction and consumption. And this is something that Marx had written about and back then and at the manifesto when we were when they were actually overproducing also yes amazingly if you read the communist manifesto he forecasts that the capitalism will by its incessant drive for profit will not only spread across the world its tentacles but it will destroy the resources of the world at an ever increasing rate because there's no control over that and there's no interest on the part of a big uh, capitalist combine in Brazil that wants to sell timber or uh, produce soybeans, they're not going to stop at knocking down the uh, the forests, the Amazonian forests, in order to do that. 
they're not going to have any, there's no control over them. Only if we had a planned and controlled uh, situation where companies were actually under the control of the state democratically, could we stop that? Instead, we have rapacious companies around the world, not only making profits, laying off people when they don't make profits, but also destroying uh, the countryside, the environment, and as we now know, a very serious problem through the rapacious increase of industrialization, uh, we have the global warming phenomenon, which scientists are pretty well convinced has been taking place, and that the world is heating up to a point where it creates the likelihood of extreme weather conditions, whether it's floods or droughts in some of the poorest areas of the world, uh, the uh, melting of the ice caps at the Arctic and Antarctica, all these situations raise whole dangers to the ecology of the world. And that is a product of capitalism. It's a product of a rapacious drive for profit and not taking into account what economists call externalities. In other words, the unintended consequences of what it does for the rest of the environment and the people around them. Michael, I'd love to ask you about your book, The Great Recession. Yeah. And this is a Marxist view of the economic crisis and the profit cycle, as you have put it. What, according to you and your understanding of your Marx Marxism, was the main cause of the Great Recession? Yes, well, just to remind listeners that the Great Recession, which took place in 2008-9, lasted for eight months, 18 months. And before that, we'd had a collapse in the house price boom that had taken place in the United States and it spread across the rest of the world. It led to a huge banking crash, as we know. And during that period of the crash, uh, all the economies went down, production slumped, unemployment shot up, and governments had to bail the banks out with huge billions of money from taxpayers, borrowing it and thus raising the debt for the government and creating conditions where governments tried to impose austerity on the population at large to pay for it. So the banks were bailed out. And this huge capitalist slump was only reverted by a huge bailout and the pumping in of money. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Well, firstly, capitalism doesn't grow and produce in a straight line harmoniously. Because it's a struggle between capitalists over private profit, it's completely unstable. And if profitability starts falling, then capitalists start reducing their investment and their production. And Marx explains in his most famous book, Capital, Communist Manifesto was a little pamphlet in 1848, but he spent the 1850s and 1860s considering the nature of capitalism, critiquing the capitalist economy by looking at England and other parts, but mainly at England, and working out a theoretical understanding of how capitalism works or why it, would, it doesn't work and why there were these booms and slumps. And so in series of volumes and notebooks, he developed that over a period of time. By the way, in a situation where he virtually had no money and had to live off his friend Engels, who was a bit better off in Manchester. Uh, so he sat in the British Museum for 10 or 15 years writing this up. Didn't finish it. Uh, there are, it's a, an infuriating sort of people who write a lot of words and then keep getting diverted onto other things and never finish anything off. But he only, Engels had to finish off a lot of his work for him after he died in 1883. So, but that capital out is a critique of how capitalism works. And he was saying in that that there are booms and slumps and capitalism doesn't go in a straight line. It, it gets into crises because profitability starts falling over a period of time because the increased mechanization of, of industry and the increased reduction of the amount of labor being used eventually reduces the profitability of capital investment and capitalism gets into a periodic and recurring crises. The Great Recession in 2008-9 was one of those, but it was the biggest since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So it was a combination of factors. We had a huge slump in credit squeeze, the banks crashed, profitability reached a new low level, it was global. It wasn't just in a few countries in Europe or the United States. It was across the world. So it was very great in that sense. And it combined with a number of other slumps, as we saw in housing and so on, to produce a very serious downturn in, in economic growth. And since then, recovery has been very weak because capitalism hasn't been able to get rid of a lot of the old debt and capital that it had built up. 
It's been propped up with a lot of cash printing of money, which doesn't really solve the problem. And so we continue rather low growth. Unemployment hasn't got back to previous levels yet in most countries. Incomes, real incomes, uh, which collapsed in 2008, have not returned to that level they were in 2008 for the majority of people in the majority of countries. And there's little, there's every prospect now that we could enter a new slump in the next year or so. So what uh, a Marxist explanation is saying to you, don't accept the idea that capitalism solves all our problems and can grow harmoniously and make us all rich, give us all jobs for the rest of their lives. There was only a brief, brief period when capitalism, at least in the major economies, appeared to give us full employment and decent incomes and a welfare state, decent health service, uh, education and so on. That was in the 60s and early 70s. We haven't seen that since. Now, uh, everywhere, all the services that we need as pub in public services like health, education, transport and so on have been cut, cut back in order to try and build up the profitability of the private sector or the capitalist sector uh, so that they can start investing again, which they haven't done yet. So what we have here is an explanation that's saying to you, look, capitalism doesn't solve our problems. It doesn't move harmoniously, harmoniously to general progress gradually. As most mainstream economists argue, they continually forecast things are going to get better, but they don't always, and they haven't been for some time. And it's telling you why that is the case, based on what Marx wrote in quite dense bits and pieces, but also interesting pieces in his volumes, which are called Capital. In other words, he called it a critique of the capitalist economy, Capital. Next up, I speak with Professor Julia Nelson, coming from episode 81. And in this clip, she talks about ecology and gender. When I studied undergrad economics, it even postgrad, and even to this day, when it, you have your textbooks, the only time that the ecological side of things comes into play is when you're looking at public goods or negative externalities. And it doesn't necessarily go as deep into explaining how this is quite impactful on our overall economy and how it could change human behavior because there's a huge absence there. Oh, there's a huge absence. I uh, worked on writing some introductory textbooks, uh, microeconomics in context and macroeconomics in context. And uh, one of the, it, they teach a lot of the usual stuff, but they teach the usual stuff as models and then broaden out to address problems in the world more adequately. And one of the things I realized was key was adding a fourth economic activity to what are the standard three. Most economics te textbooks tell you there are three basic economic activities, production, distribution, and consumption. We added one at the beginning, and what we called it very neutrally, resource maintenance. That is, how are you ever going to produce anything if you don't have the resources, if you haven't taken care of them and sustained them uh, in a way that they'll be productive in the future? When you add that in chapter one, then you can start thinking about uh, resources and ecology and other kinds of assets right off the bat. You don't have to put them off to, to chapter 18 or you know a footnote somewhere. Exactly. And you have, for example, I might be a glutton for some historical or geo uh, nat the natural geography channel or something like that, whereby you'd look at some tribes that are quite ancient, but they still have brought along with them the traditions that makes them who they are and they are so in tune with the land that they cultivate the land and they respect the land and they have to move on without trying to exhaust it like the way capitalists do and we have to have that as you mentioned resource maintenance in order for their economy to be extended into the next generation and beyond and that essentially what it is is just creating that economy that is going to be effective for the most basic of means, if you consider, say, a hierarchy in terms of how you should live. Right. Well, you're hearkening back to a historical image is interesting because I recently wrote uh, an article along similar lines, which is um, fr from the feminist economic side. There's been a lot of work on care and caring labor um, to the point where I think it's gotten a little bit too closely associated just with women. You know, like men produce and women care, which I don't agree with. But that attitude of care, that attitude of, of paying attention and nurturing is in the uh, historical image of husbandry. Uh, we still you know, hear the term animal husbandry around. 
But if you think of the uh, you know, the medieval you know husbandman, someone who you know knew their dog and their horse and their flock, you know, or, or herdsman on the Serengeti, they know their landscape. They know what the weather's you know going to be doing. They have to. And so someone who's you know attuned, you know, attuned to the natural world, attuned to the needs going on around them as they're involved in productive activity. What wouldn't uh, you know husbandman rather than economic man lead to a very different image and you know in this case it's got kind of a masculine connotation but an image of men in economics who are also uh, caring and attentive to the world and also women women could be husbandmen but this particular uh, gender you know riff i was on was about uh, reclaiming care uh, with a somewhat more masculine image who do we blame for this because it always obviously has to stem from somewhere is it john stuart mill who came up with the term rational man or economic man because economics essentially was in its infancy in terms of bringing it to the masses as an academic discipline has branched on beyond that. And we end up having to criticize the likes of the males who had dominated essentially the discipline. And, you know, when I say dominated, it has really been dominated by men, especially at the beginning. And as a result, we end up with these male connotations, really. Well, I mean, it has been and still is quite male dominated, although less so now than earlier. The idea of blame, though, um, it's probably too harsh of a word, really. Yeah, I think in terms of the development, I think we can think of um, kind of good ideals gone wrong. (laughs) Okay, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be, you know, scientific and precise, but it really goes bad if you've got a very strange idea of what, say, scientific objectivity is, which I already spoke about. Or you feel that that science has to look a certain way. You mentioned John Stuart Mill. He had a very influential essay back in 1836 that that was really the creation of the uh, a root of the economic man image. And uh, he was enthralled with geometry, and he thought, you know, geometry was really cool. You know, could we could we develop an economics that um, is scientific in the same sense as geometry? Well, I mean, geometry is really cool, but I think it's pretty stupid to try to model economics after it. I mean, John Stuart Mill also said a lot of intelligent things. And in that essay, he said no one would be so silly as to try to address an economic problem without looking at its social social and ethical and physical and political dimensions. But later economists didn't remember those cautions of Mill's and just kind of ran with the uh, math aspect of it. I had the honor to meet my next guest in person, distinguished professor Deirdre McCloskey, when she visited Ireland for a Kilconomics festival. Deirdre features in episode 114 and she discusses the change that brought about the equality of liberalism and also mentions and discusses her gender transformation. Deirdre, I'd love to know how you got into economics or yeah, how you decided to choose economics as your career path. Well, I, I, I started as a Marxist. I was a kind of soft Marxist. I called myself a Joan ba- at those times when I was 16 or 17, a Joan Baez Marxist. I sa- sang labor songs. And by the way, I sang uh, Clancy Brothers uh, Irish songs, too. But then I started to study economics, and I became a Keynesian because that's what was on offer in Harvard at the time. And then I became a kind of a economic engineer. I was a transportation economist. And then I gradually started to see the the power of the Chicago School way of talking. In fact, my first job was 12 years at the university, teaching at the University of Chicago. And that's where I truly learned economics. But then I, I saw that there was a certain narrowness on the Harvard Keynesian side and the Chicago Monitor side. They were both narrow in their method. And then I, I got interested in the, what I call the rhetoric of economics, how economists persuade each other. And from that, I, I finally got to the rhetoric of the economy, how people speak to each other and how important it is in, in, econo- in the functioning of an economy. And then I became a, a woman and a Christian. I think of myself as a Anglican church lady. And I saw the force of ethics generally in the economy, how we speak about each other in particular. And that's what the theme of my last book is, this last volume in the trilogy, is that it's the change that happened that brought about the equality of liberalism and this astonishing experience 
explosion of innovation is a spiritual and ethical change of how we view other people. Not so much, not, it's not like Max Weber thinking, imagining a psychological change within the, the breast of the entrepreneur. No, it's not that. It's how people talked about each other that changed. And we allowed each other to have a go, and the result was the modern world. Is this type of interaction that we have with one another being suppressed, is there a danger of that being suppressed now, or do you think well, we have no... no? I don't think so. I, I, you know, there are, in reaction to the great, re, the great Recession, as happened in a more extreme form in the 1930s, people have lost faith in the market to a degree. Most economists don't pay any attention to it, but still, most politicians and ordinary people have lost faith in the market. So liberalism is under attack everywhere. This, this populism that we see all over the place is anti-liberal above all. But I believe that in the long run, all societies will become liberal democracies. And the reason is the incredible magnitude of the economic gain from adopting liberal policies, as in Singapore, as in Hong Kong, as in South Korea, and Taiwan, as in Botswana, as in most spectacularly China and India. And then in the longer, if, if I can persuade people, in the longer sweep of history, I'd make the same point about Holland in the 17th century and, and uh, England and Scotland in the 18th and the, and the New World. And, and th this liberal experiment that we engaged in then and is being repeated now in China and India is so productive that I think it will win in the end. Deirdre, can I ask you about your transgender experience, if you don't mind to discuss sure, that? Sure, I, I, well, I, I, I wrote a, a book on the subject yeah. called Crossing, a memoir, so I haven't got any secrets. Ask away. Yeah. I, firstly, I'd love to know how difficult it was for you back in society at that point in time. Did anybody understand? Was there any groups that you could talk to, to, I suppose, to be yourself? Well... I know in Ireland, yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, what's the situation in Ireland? Well, in Ireland, for example, a referendum was put to the people to vote for same-sex marriage. And I think we yeah. were the first in the world, perhaps the second, I don't know, who actually, through a referendum, we decided that this yeah. was all good. And, you know, we have extreme religious people saying the Irish people are going to all burn and all this yeah, yeah. nasty attitude. Sure. We haven't done so. We haven't done so. Nothing. Everything's still good. Yeah. Um, and society is still very much... In, in many parts of the world, ignorant of this. Oh, extremely hostile, yeah, dangerously hostile. Well, I, I of course, had the big advantage, as, as anyone does in, in, a, in a liberal society, of being in Holland, where I was the first year as a woman was in Holland, and then in the United States. And Can I, sorry, can I ask you how liberating that was for you? Oh, tremendously. I mean, I... I it's not that I was a sad sack before. I was a guy and I had a happy marriage for 30 years and two, two grown children, um, by the way, who haven't spoken to me since I changed gender. It's been, that's the only bad news. The, the part of the world that gave me the most trouble, actually, is my immediate family. Um, my sister tried three times to have me committed because she thought I was crazy. She's a professor of psychology, so she had standing in court to do that, and she succeeded twice. Oh. Now we are back on good terms. My, my my mother had no trouble at all. She was wonderful. It took her five minutes to adjust, and there was no sign of this. No one knew except my former wife that I was a cross dresser occasionally, not very often. And then I, in 1995, I it I twigged. And I, I realized that what I had wanted from age 11, I could have and should have. And for the most part, because I, I work at it, so to speak, I, I want to be a woman, and I try to act 
like a woman. My voice is hopeless. I, I had an operation that was ill-advised, and that didn't work. But still, you know, I can always say it. I smoke uh, 40 cigarettes a day and drink a quart of whiskey, and that's why I have this voice. <laughs> uh, but the... I don't go out of my way to be in between the genders. I don't want that. I want to be a woman. So, as I said before, I'm, I'm a church lady. I bring cookies to church, and I and I know that, that there's a social role for women, and I, and I do it. That doesn't mean I'm happy to be, be discriminated against, as I am as a woman. Uh, the first time this happened to me, I was in Holland, and standing with a group of economists, all men except for me, and they all knew about me. And I made a point, and they ignored me. Two minutes later, George made the same point, and all the men turned to George and said, oh, George, that's a wonderful point. You ought to get an, an, an article out of that. You'll get the Nobel Prize. And I said to myself, yes, they're treating me like a woman <laughs> in ignoring me. That was the first time and the last time I've enjoyed the experience. But... It's illustrative of, of the job I'm, I've undertaken, which is to change gender, to actually change. I'm not making some political statement about a third gender or something like that. I'm, I'm, I, I, every cell in my body says I'm still male. X, Y genes, I can't do anything about it, but I can take the social role of a woman and do. So on the street I pass now, and the first year I didn't. And I just go through life as a woman. It works just fine. I think you're absolutely, you look absolutely amazing. Well, thank you, dear. You're very kind to say so. Again, you can check out these episodes over at economicrockstar.com forward slash best of part one. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.